Welcome, everybody. I'm Allison Holmes. I am a associate professor of pediatrics at Geisel. And I have the pleasure today of introducing Sam Quinones, who is a Los Angeles-based freelance journalist and author of three books of narrative nonfiction. His most recent book is Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic, in which he chronicles the many forces that have coincided to shape the current crisis that we find ourselves in. Dreamland recounts twin stories of drug marketing in the 21st century, both a pharmaceutical corporation that markets its legal new opiate prescription painkiller as non-addictive. Meanwhile, immigrants from a small town in Nayarit, Mexico, devise a method for retailing black tar heroin like pizza in the United States and take that system nationwide, riding right behind the wave of, addic of addiction to prescription pain pills from coast to coast. The collision of those two forces has led to America's deadliest drug scourge in modern times. Dreamland was selected as one of the best books of 2015 by Amazon.com, Slate.com, The Daily Beast, BuzzFeed, The Seattle Times, The Boston Globe, and many others. Mr. Quinona's previous two highly acclaimed books, True Tales from Another Mexico, and Antonio's Gun and Delfino's Dream grew from his 10 years of living and working as a freelance writer in Mexico between 1994 and 2004. He is formerly a reporter with the Los Angeles Times, where he worked for 10 years from 2004 to 2014. He's a veteran reporter on immigration, gangs, drug trafficking, and the US-Mexico border. I read Dreamland just about a year ago on April vacation. And when I finished, I wrote to Mr. Quinones about how his explanation helped me understand how we got to where we are today and how it affects my work as a pediatrician caring for the many newborns in our region as opioid exposure and pregnancy affects 10% of our well newborns and our newborn service at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. I'm telling this story to those of you in school or in other training in graduate or professional studies or as fellows or early career faculty members because if a book or an article, scientific article, moves you, it might be a really good idea to reach out to the author. Don't think that what you think isn't worth expressing. As an academic physician, I answer all the queries about my work. So Mr. Quinones graciously answered my inquiry of him, and here we are today. So I'd like to thank the staff at TDI particularly, and faculty, particularly Ellen Mira, Kathy Strofolino, and Mika Tucker, the staff of the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy, and the C. Everett Coop Institute, um, and the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Geisel Departments of Pediatrics, Psychiatry, and Obstetrics and Gynecology for coming together to sponsor this visit. We're grateful that you accepted our invitation, and we're looking forward to hearing more. Sam Quinones. Thank you very much. Doc. Can you guys hear me there? Yeah. All right, my man's up there. Okay. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, you, you were talking, and I go, I think I remember that email. Oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. That was when people be first began writing me, I think, or not too, too, too long after. And um, I began to pick up on the, 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 the impact the book might be having. And um, I could tell you I was totally stunned. Um, never get, I'm a, crime reporter, you know, I'm just a crime reporter, and to get e emails from doctors was uh, um, just awe-inspiring sometimes, I have to say. <laughs> I don't know how I deserved it, honestly. It was weird. But anyway, thank you so much, and thank you to Kathy Shuffling, and where is Joanne? She's up there somewhere. Uh, Joanne Newman from the, uh, and Mika Tucker somewhere, too. There you are. Thank you so much. Uh, I've had a long day already. I've had a uh, conversations with like five different groups or something like that, right? And it's been great. It's been, um, I will sleep well tonight, but it was a, uh, it was a very nice um, uh, thing. And the last group um, was a college class that I took my 10-year-old daughter to, Caroline, she's up there, and she saw what real college students are and decided never to go to college ever as long as she lived. <laughs> Uh, and she is going to be a potter now for the rest of her life. Okay, that's so good. Thank you, Dartmouth. 
for that. <laughs> I'm kidding. It was wonderful. And, um, and so anyway, I'm here and it's uh, great um, to be here. You know, New Hampshire, never been to New Hampshire before, I think. Um, and it's been uh, um, just an amazing thing. Uh, I've written three books. As the doctor said, and I, uh, I the, the past, the previous two, I'm extraordinarily proud of, but uh, I have to say uh, they were like pushing rocks up a hill to get people interested. This is what writers do. You just battle and battle and battle to get your books read. And then every once in a while, some people want to read them, and that's really nice. And so it's just wonderful to be here. So thank you very much. Um, so, um, and I think there's a whole bunch of people in another room, right? How you guys doing over there? <laughs> it's really good for you, of you to be here too. Um, so anyway, today I wanted to talk a little bit about how my conception of how this whole thing started, because it is, you know, I know this is a terrible problem in uh, New Hampshire, but of course you should know if you don't already that this is of course a national problem. It is coast to coast. Uh, it's only uh, different by, by degrees, I think. Um, and by how much people are willing to address it and confront it and, and, and deal with it. Um, it is uh, um, in wealthy areas, it's in uh, poor areas, it's almost entirely in white areas, um, poor or wealthy. Uh, when I was writing the book, um, I, I told my wife, who's also here now, that um, this book was going to die. We were going to put it out and it was just going to go nowhere because nobody wanted to talk about it. I could not find parents, particularly, who wanted to talk about this topic. And I'm a reporter and I know from years of experience that if you do not have parents on board, you got nothing. You know, politicians didn't care. This was, remember, 2012, 13, 14, those years. If you can remember back that far, this issue was on nobody's radar. Didn't seem to me, and I, I, it seemed to me I had to struggle extraordinarily hard just to get any, just to get a few parents to talk to me. And so I uh, just um, kept plugging along, and, and now here we are two years later, and it's, it's amazing. So um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a story, of my conception of how this worked or how this happened, my own background, my own story as well, how this all fit into it. Um, probably most important, I think, is that um, uh, I began... Um, my, my adolescence began in the 1970s when I watched all, uh, when th the last time heroin was a big deal. And my only connection to it was really watching those great heroin movies, right? Out of New York, Serpico, that's why I got an earring. <laughs> earring, Al Pacino wore an earring in Serpico. What was that, 74 or something like that? And I just was like, ah, when I get, when I get to college, I'm gonna get my, and I freak my parents out by coming home with an earring in my ear one time, and I was never left. Anyway, um, French Connection, Prince of the City, you know, these great movies about heroin, and you know, I always thought heroin was white powder, or this kind of stuff comes from the Far East, right? In a fast forward, I'm a reporter, I get a job in the town of Stockton, California, which is a magnificent town, I love Stockton, California. I was a uh, crime reporter there, and as part of my job, I learned a lot about a lot of things. It was really the crack epidemic back then. That's what I really covered. But I did learn some about heroin. And what I learned was that um, we did not have any white powder heroin in, in Stockton. It was only black tar. Black tar heroin, if you don't know, if you haven't seen it, is a kind of a sticky, uh, gooey stuff like Tootsie Roll. It, just like heroin, just not as processed as the white powder that you may be more familiar with. All of it comes from Mexico in this hemisphere anyway, and uh, none of it really crossed the Mississippi. It was a Western U.S. drug, and we had it, it was all that was available in, 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 in California. And, uh, several years later, I go to Mexico, lived there for 10 years, and uh, in Mexico, what I learned that was relevant to this story was um, many things, but I covered immigration, lots of immigration uh, stories. That's what I really focused on. I didn't really focus on drug trafficking. I thought that was a minor thing. A big, big issue was uh, political change, economic change in Mexico, and immigration, and I covered that. And what I learned was, one, among the many things I learned, was that there was a, um, there were, in Mexico it was very common to find villages where everybody did the same job. So you find everybody's a construction worker in one town. Everybody um, is, in one, my first book I wrote a, a story about everybody, uh, this one town where everyone is a, um, 
uh, a popsicle maker. And if you know Mexico, you know La Mich Paleteria La Michoacana. It's all over Mexico, thousands of little popsicle shops. Uh, business model, not franchise, business models and that, that people kind of imitate and they do well or they do poorly, but everyone has their own little business and it turns poor people into middle class people. And if you go to the town where all the people who, who started this are from, in to Michoacan, a town called Tocumbo, you will see at the entrance to town, you can't m miss it because at the entrance of town is a two-story concrete popsicle about as high as this wall. <laughs> True story. Um, Anyway, I come back and I'm put on a, I come back and get a job to, to LA with the LA Times. A few years in, I get a job uh, uh, assigned to a team of reporters writing about the, the, the um, uh, drug war that's kicked off in Mexico. Uh, very serious, very savage, barbaric thing. Nothing like that had ever happened when I was in Mexico. My job was to cover people, how, how drugs, drugs are trafficked once they cross the border, right? They're in Phoenix, they're in LA, where, how do they get to the rest of the country, that kind of thing. So I was tooling around the internet one day, 2009, I come upon a whole slew of stories about how people, maybe a dozen people in six months had died um, in the town of Huntington, West Virginia, to overdoses of black tar heroin. And this blew my mind. I, I looked at that and I could not believe it. it. A few things hit me. First of all, What's black tar heroin doing east of the Mississippi River? What's black tar heroin doing in West Virginia? I checked, West Virginia has the lowest percentage of foreign born people in the whole 50 states. And what's it, so what are Mexican heroin doing in a town, state with no Mexicans? And why is there heroin, an appetite for heroin at all in the state of West Virginia? Those movies never mention West Virginia. <laughs> As a, as a, a source of hair, a, a, a place where heroin was a big time thing. So I call Huntington PD. And this guy, he goes, well, yeah, I rem we remember that time very well. 2007, a dozen people died and many, many more OD'd or the paramedics. Uh, uh, the paramedics saved them. We, we'd have had a bunch, a bunch more people die. Uh, we had had up to then one uh, overdose in 10 years and all of a sudden we were getting, you know, a dozen people die but many people OD during that, during that time. He says, you've got to call Columbus DEA, I do, and I get a wonderful cop by the name of actually Tony Maranta who was just magnificent. He was mad. That was a great thing about him. I bring up heroin, he gets mad. You know, man, I've been here 25 years. I've been doing DEA work 25 years. I've been here in Columbus 10, and back when I got here, there was no heroin in 2000, and, I mean, 1999, this was 2009 I was talking to. Then we begin to see these guys, these Mexican, Mexican guys showing up, driving around town, old cars, dressed down, baseball caps, look like, look like Home Depot workers or whatever, their mouths full with little balloons, those balloons each were filled with tenth of a gram doses of black tar heroin. They look like chipmunks. Like this. And they have a big jug of water next to them in case the cops pull them over. They swig it down. We, began, we thir first thought they were independent guys, just one-off one kind of guys. Then we began arresting them, begin to realize, no, these guys are part of a, a crew. We begin to understand that they actually have a crew of guys. There's, and they, and they have a specific system for selling heroin retail, very much, looks very much like home pizza delivery. So you, the addict, call a number in, uh, in, 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 in Columbus. Uh, there's an, addict, uh, an operator standing by to take your order. The operator dispatches one of each crew, has like three, four drivers, mouths full of stuff. They dispatch the driver to wherever you are. Burger King parking lot, Target parking lot, something like that. They, an international drug deal is consummated. He spits out five p -p -p balloons, bam, puts them in your palm. You give them the money, you're on your way. That was their, that was their uh, business. He said, I've never seen anything like that uh, in my entire time in this business. He said, uh, strangely, there uh, other things were weird. He said they pay these drivers a salary. Nobody in the drug business ever gets a salary. Right? They don't use guns. My conception and his of the, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, underworld is that you gain market share, the drug underworld, you gain market share through the bar barrel of a gun. That's what Al Capone did, Bloods and Crips, the Colombians, you go all through history, it's always, but here's guys who are, no, they didn't do it at all. 
He said they dress down. We, we uh, arrest them. They don't party. They don't do anything. We arrest them. They send up new ones. We arrest those guys. They send up more. We, have arre we can ar arrest them all, but we cannot eradicate this problem. Then he told me something that changed uh, my life. And then he said, the strangest thing is, they're all from the same town. Now, I was so ready to hear that. I remember like in my chair kind of going, I was like this leaning back and I come forward and I go, which town would that be? He gets back on the phone, talks to his case, and he says, Tepic, Tepic, Nayarit. And right there, see, I knew he was wrong. He, didn't, he wasn't lying, he just had the wrong info. Tepic is a capital city, it's 350,000 people. It's the capital of the state of Nayarit. It's, Nayarit is a small state uh, on the Pacific coast of Mexico, just straight down from Arizona, you see it. This, this system could not possibly have been uh, devised in, in, a, in a big, big uh, city like that. It had to be in a small village. And that was my, uh, my feeling. And so I said to him, um, well, you've arrested a lot of guys. Can you give me names? He gave me a bunch of names of people that were in prison, doing a lot of time in prison. I write to, I don't know, that first batch, I think 15 guys, something like that. And I wait. My entire idea was that this, there's a town. I knew, I knew. I could feel it was true. There was a town out there where everybody in that little village came north to the United States, I thought, to Columbus, Ohio, to sell heroin like pizza. And that sounded like a hell of a good story. So I write to them all. And I wait, and I wait, and I wait for weeks. And I'm about to go on to my next story, figuring, oh, well, you gave it a good shot. Let's move on. When one guy, bless his heart, calls me out of the blue and says, hey, yeah. I got your letter. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm from the town. I am, it, it, we are not from Tepic. We are from a little town called Jalisco, which uh, is just, and I didn't really know Nayarit 10 years in Mexico. I've really never been there. I'm on the phone while he's doing this, and I'm typing, Googling, and I'm saying, oh, yes, it's, it's, there is a town called Jalisco, Nayarit. 20,000 people in a county of about 40,000, a lot of little villages. He says, everybody, every man who comes here sells heroin just like this. He told me the story of how they did this. He said they, they, a few families, a lot of immigrants from this village had started in the San Fernando Valley, working in legitimate jobs. A few of those families knew how to cook opium poppy goo, opium goo into black tar heroin. You should know that the opium poppy, by the way, grows very nicely in the mountains of Pacific and Northwest Mexico. We cook that. They would just set up in parks and cut off little, chip off little pieces of heroin to the addicts who would come to them. This was in the early, early 1980s. As time went by, though, more and more families got into the job, saturated them. Our cops became wise, began to pick off some of these guys, arrest them. They, they go to cars at that point. They go to cars to expand their market and to get away from the cops and actually the gang members, too, who were kind of preying on, on them. Uh, uh, as well. These, the guys, these, these families were not kind of cartel killers. They were young guys. They were, they were uh, former uh, sugarcane farmers, uh, bakers, butchers, avocado, avocado farmers looking for a kind of a, 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 a way up. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there we go. And in time, they developed what were really the, the rudimentary out, the ru a rudimentary outline of this system that is, that they, they, that is now all across, all, that is across, all across the country, where the, the, the addicts would call a number, and the, 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 the person at the ho in the house, the person in the house would call the driver, and the driver would go deliver. Of course, back then it was pagers and, uh, and beepers and, and, uh, and, and, and pay phones, but uh, eventually cell phones ra uh, revolutionized. Uh, the business, and they did in time, as they've saturated that area, um, they did what any capitalist entity, every capitalist enterprise or franchise does when they face declining profitability, they expand. They begin first to go to San Diego, Pomona, Ontario, it's outside LA, um, uh, they go to Reno, they go Denver, or Albuquerque, eventually uh, Portland's a big place, et cetera, on and on. I always wondered why, how it could be that they would, they would do that if all the time cops are arresting them. They, the guy was very clear, we could arrest these guys easily, but they keep sending, why would they keep, how would they be able to get more labor? This, this expanded based on something we're all very familiar with, which is cheap 
Mexican labor. How would they convince anybody to do that? And I, uh, as I got into this story, I began to realize one way, there were many ways, but one way was they had figured out that this system of transforming black tar heroin, uh, of, of, of selling cheap black tar heroin was a perfect system for transforming it into stacks of beautiful Levi's 501 jeans. I was in Mexico, this was when, like in the early 90s when this really began to expand. I was in Mexico at that time. I remember how important, how much a status symbol Levi's 501 jeans were compared to the cheap, flimsy, poor, looking Mexican jeans. They said, you have arrived, is what it, those, jeans, those jeans said. They figured out that they were dealing with addicts, and addicts were great shoplifters, and they would d steal anything these guys wanted for a hit of dope. And they began to say, steal me Levi's 501 jeans. And soon, these, they would give them long lists, you know, like uh, sizes and colors. Oh, okay, I'm done with blue, maybe green, maybe white. They would take these, these addicts would clean, clean out a, a, a Penny's or a, or a Target or a Sears or whatever, and they'd bring them these guys and they'd trade them a hit for a pair of pants. Boom, boom, boom. And they, they would, over a period of months, come back home with huge stacks of Levi's 501 jeans and give them out like, like Santa Claus. When they did that, all those kids back home, first of all, when they did that, all the girls wanted to talk to them. They had a whole bunch of new friends, and all the other boys in town saw that these guys had what it took, they had the money, they had the jeans, and they began to raise their hand. Hell yeah, I'll go drive heroin, whatever you want to do, so I could get Levi's five, so I could come back with this new status that those, those pants uh, uh, involved. Uh, these guys, as I said, were not cartel killers. They were poor boys, they were bakers, they were butchers. They were uh, polite, they were terrified, they were scared to be here. They didn't like Amer America, they didn't speak any any, any English, they just wanted to make their, their five, their 10,000 bucks and go back home and be the big guy and buy a new used car and maybe some land to build, to build a, a house. And we think of drug cartels in, in America from Mexico and certainly that's part of the story, but the other really big part of the story is that there's lots of small time operators who do this part time to full time and uh, they, are, they are looking to make enough money to get a girl to marry them. Um, but they were the Jalisco boys, as I used to call, as I take it to call them, part of a much larger story It's important to understand if you want to understand heroin today, and that is that in the 1970s, during, up until the 1970s, those, those, um, those great movies in New York were about heroin coming from the Far East, Turkey, Burma, Thailand, wherever, right? That heroin got here expensive and weak. It had to go from thousands of miles, change hands several times, it got cut, it got cut. In the 1980s, all that changed. Our entire heroin market changed. It became, the, the cartels from Colombia were very advanced by then. The Mexican guys were getting more and more advanced. Essentially, those two countries, their heroin outcompeted all that Far East. Heroin stopped coming from the Far East, and basically they took over the entire market. Colombia, since then, we don't have almost any heroin that isn't coming from Colombia, or, or, or increasingly today, it's almost all, all Mexico. For a long time, it was, it was Colombia. But the Jalisco boys were part of that, that in historic move that nobody noticed, by the way. We did not notice that. Only people who noticed that were the DEA, because they had to. But we, we were involved with other things, right? We were involved with uh, crack and math and other things were taking our, our, our attention away. We did not really pay much attention to, to this whole um, uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, the Jalisco boys moved, like franchises, across the Western um, uh, United States. They competed, frequently they competed among each other. They couldn't kill each other because they're all from the same town. So they became master marketers. The only way, this was a time when the number of addicts was static in each town. Salt Lake City had 150 addicts. Three, four, five crews would come. They'd have to steal customers from each other, but they couldn't kill each other. They knew where each other's mothers lived back home. So they had to become master marketers. They give discounts, come ons, five, you buy from me Monday through Saturday, I'll give you one free one on Sunday. Bring me five new addicts, 50 free balloons. They, had, they gave away free dope in front of methadone clinics. They would give um, uh, uh, customer service calls. Was the dope any good? How 
Did the guy come on time? No? Okay, well, here's some more. I'm going to send him over right now. He's going to be in time this time. Give you a free hit, that kind of thing. I want you to stick with me and stay with me. <clears throat> Again, this was a time when, when the number of addicts weren't, weren't, weren't uh, uh, expanding. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in the end, they branded, by the way, this was a, also the fascinating thing. They branded like, like Pepsi or Coke did. You know what's in a can of Coca-Cola when you buy it. Addicts knew what was in a, can, a, a little balloon of, of their heroin. It was going to be a tenth of a gram. It was going to be good. It was going to be potent. If it wasn't, there was, a, there was a customer service number that they knew to call, and they could do it. And in the end, marketing worked. Far better, in fact, than, than guns. They spread to towns all across the United States, and frequently they took over a very significant chunk of the market in each of those towns in which they landed. But none of this really explained to me one crucial question I had initially about West Virginia, and that was, why West Virginia? Right? Why would there be so much dope and West, uh, appetite for dope in West, for West Virginia? And that, I came to realize later, that I was focusing, and I was very, very deep into the story for a while, I was focusing on this little small, what turned out, looked big to me, but really was a small part of a much larger story. And behind me was this enormous tidal wave of a story that I had not seen. The Lisco Boys would kind of be a cool little interesting tale, and, but not terribly relevant to anything, had it not been for a revolution in medicine and really in pain management in the United States that took pla place in the 19, in the 1980s. Uh, 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 and, in, and increasingly, and, and really gaining momentum in the 1990s. This was a revolution uh, I instigated by certain, uh, uh, by, pain, by young pain specialists. Pain specialists, their specialty just coming into its own. They become young Turks, seared, in fact, by this traumatic experience of seeing how poorly we treated pain up to that point, or didn't treat pain, as the case may be. In, in particular, how we treated terminal cancer patients. People dying in utter agony, and, and doctors saying, no, well, I can't give you any pills for that. We have opiate painkillers, yeah, but you'll grow addicted. And these guys are saying, why do we care about that? They've got three months to live. Let them live in, uh, you know, free of this inhumane humane pain. And they formed a kind of a collective consciousness, seared by how poorly pain had been treated uh, before. Young guys getting into medicine for the right reasons, wanted to assuage people's pain, and seeing how poorly it was done. They kind of, they grew to, delector, to develop a kind of a collective conscious. They go to conferences together, get to know each other, and pretty soon they begin to believe all together that this, they need to break down these old walls that are standing in the way of, of humane pain treatment. And they win that first argument pretty pretty um, uh, uh, quickly. They, they, people begin to say, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. But these guys kept pushing. They kept pushing and pushing, and they began to make the argument that these pills, we needed to use these opiate painkillers, that pain was being treated poorly, that we were a country in an epidemic of pain, and that we had, what's more, very good tools to deal with it we were afraid to use because we were fair, afraid of addiction. And they began to make the, the argument that these pills were really, we were un, inordinately afraid of them. There was no need to fear them. These pills were, were not addictive when used to treat pain, virtually non-addictive when used to treat pain. Less than 1% of all pain patients get addictive. These were the, the buzz phrases that they began to use, and re really there was uh, no evidence of that. But they were revolutionaries, and, the, pain and the, the, the ends justified the means, so they kept pushing and pushing. But, you know, they, they were able to keep pushing, I think, because there were certain things happening in American society that I believe uh, were, were part of this. Um, uh, at the time, in, and certainly in, 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 in medicine, a patient's rights movement had developed. It's held that, that uh, we needed to, doctors needed to listen to the patient, which is a good idea, except for it kind of went too far. That, got pushed to an extreme and all of a sudden patients were telling the doctors what needed to happen. The, the doctor's clinical experience was kind of subtracted from all this. There was an idea that uh, there was floated back then, a philosophy really, that pain is what the patient says when, says when the patient says and where the patient says. Again, kind of depriving the, uh, the, the, the patient really of, their, of the doctor's clinical, clinical uh, uh, exper exper uh, experience. In 1996, 
uh, the world changed in this regard, in this story, with the introduction of OxyContin. OxyContin is a game changer in a number of ways, but one way was how it was marketed. The pharmaceutical industry began to ally with these pain specialists who eagerly embraced them as the, as the manufacturers of new tools of pain management. Hallelujah, we have OxyContin. They began to believe that OxyContin was in fact non-addictive because it leaked the, 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 the drug, oxycodone, the opiate painkiller, in over a period of uh, 12 hours, supposedly. Purdue's, um, uh, which is a privately held company out of, out of Connecticut, 1996, comes out with it. It, it was a game changer because, first of all, of the way, in the way it was promoted. It was promoted to doctors to convince doctors that these pills were non-addictive. The way they did that was to promote it somewhat like you promote over-the-counter medicine to docs. They gave away stuff. They gave away hats. They gave away calendars, pens. They gave away a cool little CD called Swing in the Right Direction with OxyContin with a couple, a, a, an elderly couple walking in a garden hand-in-hand hand on the cover, I guess, swinging to OxyContin. Uh, and the, 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 the CD was a bunch of old swing tunes, you know, Andrew's Sisters, Count Basie, uh, all this. They, they, they came up with free coupons for a week. Free coupons, free coupons, check that out, idea out. Free week long, uh, coupons for a week for, for OxyContin. And their, their motto was stick with us and start, the one to start with and stay with. <coughs> this was also a time of great, of enormous of expansion of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, uh, sales reps, they, what I call a pharmaceutical sales rep uh, arms race. More and more, every company hiring more and more farmers. Uh, Purdue hired a thousand sales reps to market this stuff, um, and they were tripping over each other and, uh, in doctors' in doctors' offices. But in the end, marketing worked. Doctors began to believe that these pills were virtually non-addictive, and they began crucially, crucially to believe the corollary, which was if these pills are non-addictive, then it didn't matter how many of these pills you prescribe because they're going to be non-addictive. No ceiling on, on, on dose. And soon, pain, opiate painkillers were being used in huge amounts for things that before they never had been uh, uh, extracted wisdom, wisdom teeth. And not just in, in areas where they hadn't been used, but in huge amounts. So people began getting 30 days worth of opiate painkillers for a surgical pain that was going to last, post-surgical pain, that was going to last two or, th or three days, and then a refill too, if they wanted one. They were massively overprescribed, and a huge new, unprecedented supply of opiates begins to slosh uh, around the country. Ground zero for all this was where Purdue and many of the other pharmaceutical companies began to really heavily promote, and that was in the area, uh, Columbus to the north, southern Indiana, Eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, virtually all of West Virginia, uh, parts of Virginia, Eastern Tennessee, US, Eastern Pennsylvania, that very roughly drawn, that whole area was really kind of the first area. And I think they went there because they had strong, strong data that th in those areas, doctors were already prescribing huge amounts of drugs of all kinds. Doctors had become not just answers to health problems, but answers to economic problems. And that was an area in economic pain as well as, as physical uh, pain. People understood that in order to navigate unemployment, they needed workers' comp, or SSI, or SSDI, and in order to get any of that, you needed a doctor's signature. And soon, doctors were, they were part of that community. They were feeling the pain of people losing their, jo their factory jobs or coal miner jobs, whatever it happened to be, or people who were in pain from those, from those jobs. And Purdue and other pharmaceutical companies had data, data showing that who those doctors were, where they lived, and that's that area was one area that, 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 that had that. Of course, that's all Appalachia. One town I spent a lot of time in in that area, right almost at the center of that, is a town called Portsmouth, Ohio, where I spent a lot of, a lot of time. It's on the, uh, the, 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 the Ohio River, across from Kentucky. Uh, Portsmouth is a long way uh, from here, but in a lot of ways, it's right around the corner from uh, almost every part of America that's affected uh, by this. It was in its great days uh, kind of an all-American town, selected, in fact, two years running, all-American town. It was where the first NFL night game was held back in, I think, 1929, and a team that was, uh, later became the Detroit Lions. It had a steel mill. 
It had a shoe, uh, shoe factories. It had um, uh, a bustling Main Street packed with locally owned stores. It had 50,000 uh, population. And uh, at the center of life was this enormous football field sized swimming pool um, that was in fact, became, had become kind of the center of civic and almost emotional life of, of the community. It was the town babysitter is where parents would drop their kids off at nine and came back at five. And they knew their kids were gonna be fine all summer long watching, watch, everyone would watch their kids uh, uh, for them, you know, for free, for the cost of an, an admissions, where everybody saw each other. Every, the radio station knew that so many people, so many of their listeners were at the, at the pool all summer long that they had a jingle every 30 minutes that said, time to turn so you won't burn. And everybody at the pool would turn over. <laughs> the owner of the, of, the, of, the, of the pool also owned a shoe, check this guy's attitude out, God bless him. The owner owned, also owned a shoe factory. He didn't need the money from the pool. How I wish I could hear some of these attitudes uh, uh, from some of our CEOs. Anyway, he didn't need the money from the pool, so he reinvested it. And slowly the pool, he bought more land. There was now room for a basketball court. There was now room for a, uh, uh, um, you know, picnic tables. And, uh, and, uh, and, and they had dances on Friday nights around the pool. Class differences melted away. The name of this pool, this pool that kind of held everybody in, 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 into, brought everybody into community, the name of this pool was Dreamland. Class differences kind of melted away at, at Dreamland because the factory owner and the factory worker all looked the same in, in, swim, in swim trunks. Cycle of, uh, uh, of life. There was, always, there was always room for more at Dreamland. It, it, and more and more people, more and more things could happen at, at, at Dreamland. The cycle of life repeated itself at Dreamland. A, do, a, a young girl would be a toddler in the shallow end jumping off the diving board in high school, lose a virginity in the field, her daughter would start again in the shallow end. In 1980, the steel factory closes. Shoe factories are kind of gradually already leaving. Soon the job's depleting, uh, hurts Main Street. It begins to uh, hollow out. Eventually, most of what's sold on Main Street is basically sucked up and regurgitated onto the floor of the Walmart in the outskirts of town. It opens up on the outskirts of town. Half the population leaves. Many houses and buildings become ab grow abandoned. And in 1993, Dreamland Pool is dug up and replaced by a big asphalt strip mall. Walmart replaced... I think it was my phone. My bad. <laughs> it's your phone. No. <laughs> it's not your. Okay. <laughs> Don't you hate when that happens? I do. No problem. Uh, Walmart replaced Dreamland as the place where people saw each other. It was the only place where people could get together anymore. People were turned inside. Half the people left. <clears throat> Real human connection and community was replaced by, was something more kind of akin to a superficial and fleeting contact that we get on, 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 super, on, on social media. The end of Dreamland, I think, spelled the end of community the, in a real sense. It, took, it was a kind of a stripping away of the societal immune system that kept the most serious problems um, uh, at bay, and it left the, this left the town uh, vulnerable. Portsmouth was right at the heart, as I said, of this massive pill promotion. And in time, its importance to this story is that in time, it was the place where the pill mill was invented. That pill mill, a kind of a, a pain clinic, but really becomes a kind of a scandalous quackery of doctors uh, you know, selling prescriptions by the hundreds, two, three minutes a patient, uh, paying no, no, doing no diagnosis whatsoever, long lines, people in pajamas lining up to get their prescription for a big long list of, of narcotic pain pills that then go fill them at some pharmacist. That was a, that's the pain 
uh, that's the pill mill, and that was invented in, in, in Portsmouth, Ohio. And at the height of this problem, there was a dozen of those pi uh, pill mills prescribing 9 million pills a year to a town now of 20,000 people. So many pills were prescribed that an Oxycontin economy developed. <clears throat> uh, people could pay for anything with pills. You could pay for T-bone steaks and cable service and cars and whatever you, you wanted. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Crucial to this economy, again, was Walmart. Before, uh, before people would have had to steal from merchant after merchant after merchant every, every day to make their daily nut. But one-stop shopping also led to one-stop uh, stealing. So to make his habit each day, all an addict had to do was go down to Walmart, figure out there was amazingly ingenious ways of ripping off Walmart, and there was no locally, local guy there who knew them to guard against his, guard his store from theft. It was a 68-year-old greeter who was not going to be facing off with some wide-eyed addict who was running out the store with a, with a, with a chainsaw. So all this was going on. So all this was going on. You had the pain revolution happening in America. You had a heavy pill promotion right there in, uh, in that ground zero area. You had uh, 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 Portsmouth as the new head of the center for pill mills and pill mills spilling out everywhere. As all that was going on, the Jalisco boys from Nayarit, Mexico, <laughs> land in Columbus, Ohio in 1998. We have this idea that somehow there's kind of these corporate decisions being made. Oh, we'll send them there. No, that one guy. One guy does it. He hears from another guy, an addict in a, in a casino in Reno. Uh, the guy says, man, this addict tells him, man, nobody's got stuff like this where I'm from. You take this stuff to Columbus, Ohio, you will make a million. So he does at that very, at that very moment. He came by pure coincidence, the area was all this was happening. They, the guys from, from Jalisco landed in Columbus <clears throat> and soon realized what they'd stumbled onto them. And from then on, they just, followed, they just followed the pills. They went from there to Cincinnati, Lexington, Louisville, Charlotte, Minneapolis, uh, Memphis, uh, Nashville, Indianapolis. A new, all, throughout this area, a new kind of drug trafficking, no guns, branding, marketing, met a new kind of drug promotion, coupons, giveaways, fr free Giveaways in front of methadone clinics, they've met free coupons of, of, uh, of OxyContin. The one to start with and stay with was almost the motto for both of these, of these groups. I write about the Jalisco boys not because they're only traffickers from Mexico, far from it. I write about them because they are the first to figure out and systematically exploit the idea that very soon they follow the pills and soon they will have an enormous heroin market the likes of which they have never seen on the Western United States, and they find that first in Columbus and the surrounding, surrounding areas. But in all this, of course, OxyContin was, again, the game changer. Huh? Up to that point, many people had messed around with Vicodin and Percocet, low dose, all of those, you know, they have acetaminophen in them, they have Tylenol. You develop, you can't develop a very large uh, 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 tolerance to that without doing huge damage to your, to your innards, your internal uh, organs. There was no bridge between these opiates and heroin up to that point. Then OxyContin comes along. OxyContin is that bridge. People develop huge tolerances. Very, there's no uh, 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 other kinds of pain, no abuse to turn in OxyContin for the first 14 years of that pill's life. People develop huge tolerances to that. Very expensive. Sometimes they lose their insurance. Doctor cuts them off, whatever. They begin looking for a new cheaper alternative to keep their, because they're terrified of withdrawals, to, to, to their kind of a maintenance drug. Let's find something cheaper. And all of a sudden, it really, really matters, that historical change, that historic change back in the 1980s in our heroin market that nobody noticed until we began minting thousands and thousands of new, new addicts every, every, every year in, in the United States. They found cheap Mexican heroin. We would not have a heroin problem today without OxyContin. Okay? It just wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't it would have happened. We would not have the same kind of heroin problem today if we had the, the very expensive and weak heroin coming from the Far East that we used to have. We have it today, a serious problem today, because we have cheap, potent Mexican heroin coming from up, up from the South. As it turned out, what I'd stumbled on in Huntington was simply the first example 
People have been dying. It was the first example of people switching from the pills to heroin and then dying. In 2007, it was really kind of the first time you see that in large numbers. But remember, now we're seeing that, of course, coast to coast, all over the country, up here, everywhere. Right? But of course, remember, before that, people were dying in large numbers from the pills alone. We surpassed the number of traffic fatalities, OOD fatalities, surpassed the number of traffic fatalities without really heroin being part of the, part of the, of, of, of the picture. This epidemic is the first example in post-modern, in, in, in post-war modern America of, of, a, of, a, of an epidemic, drug scourge started without street peddlers, street mafias. It starts entirely by doctors believing something that wasn't always true in an effort to help us assuage our pain. Slowly and quietly addiction spread, spread because no violence was associated. It was not the crack epidemic. There was no drive-by shootings. Crime rates were dropping as ODs were going higher. Appalachia was the canary in our societal coal mine. We are all used to ignoring uh, Appalachia. It really then spread to middle class and wealthy suburbs all, all across the country. Alabama, Vermont, Tennessee, Wisconsin, Orange County, all these are our heroin beltways today and right here, of course, in, in New Hampshire. But what's strange about many of these areas, that the, what I found as I got into that story was that it's the children of the people who benefited most from the economic run-ups of the last, what, 30 years. It's many of those kids who are getting addicted on drugs, used, of all things, to numb pain. Like you look at that, what pain could they possibly Every, their lives are perfect. And it's at that point that I began to realize I was, I was writing, I was involved in a much bigger book than I thought. That I thought I was writing a book about drug trafficking and crime and stuff. And I realized that this was really more about who we are. This book had become something about who we are as Americans, about who we had become, what we had become as a, as a country. I'm just a reporter, but there, I can, there's a lot of, I couldn't avoid certain uh, conclusions. To me, it seems that we have spent 35 years in this country destroying community. As we did, we exalted the private sector, came to believe the free market was some kind of infallible god once we beat uh, 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 communism, began to admire wealthy business people just for the fact of being wealthy, regardless of how their money made, uh, helped or, or hindered our, 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 our community or our country. At, at the same time, we, it became fashionable to laugh at government, to believe it, to incompetent, to therefore uh, believe it's okay not to pay taxes. It's going to be a rationale for not uh, paying taxes. Years ago, we had a president who said government is the problem. And our conservative think tanks began to posit the idea that government, in fact, posed the greatest threat to personal freedom. Yet here, this story is one in which the private sector unleashes the greatest threat, in my opinion, to personal freedom in America today, and that is opiate addiction, completely enslaving uh, uh, substance. And I was, as I was doing this story, moreover, I began to realize that only, the only folks who were fighting this early on, before the parents wanted to talk about it as they do today, were coroners, cops, public health nurses, jailers, prosecutors, ER docs, all of whom were drawing a government salary. In this story, all profits have been privatized. The Sackler family that owns Purdue Pharma is now one of the wealthiest families in America, valued at 14, by Forbes estimates they're worth, net worth at $14 billion, more than the Mellons, more than the, than the, than the, than the Rockefellers. <coughs> all due to $35 billion, of course, of sales of OxyContin since the drug came out. All costs in this story, apart from the family costs, all costs are borne by the, by the public sector, right? Jails, courts. E uh, ERs, county hospitals, uh, police, et cetera. This was also t a time, not only did we believe kind of exalting the private sector, but this was also a time when we believed in silver bullets, easy answers, I think, to, um, you know, to, complicated, to complicated problems, and that old rules don't apply to us. We feared pain, I think. We came to believe that we as Americans kind of had a, it should be, we were exceptional, therefore we, we, we should be uh, entitled to a life without pain. Doctors were car mechanics, and our car bodies were cars, and they should fix us. And by the way, we weren't really going to be participating in our own wellness. So if they told us we had to eat better, get more exercise, or what, stop smoking, we were like, eh, well, maybe. I don't think so. That's too hard. 
It was a time when we began to believe in, I think, in, there was, we believed in fantasy. We believed, remember, that, uh, that uh, gee, several baseball players every year could hit more than 60 home runs. <laughs> when it only been twice in the whole history of the sport, and it hasn't happened since those years, remember? We believed that it was a fantastic idea to package into, into uh, securities massive numbers of poorly performing home loans, Standard & Poor's would mark them AAA, and that was just the perfect place for you to park your, your, your investment money. And we began to believe that massive, widespread uh, uh, prescribing of opiate painkillers would not somehow result in massive, widespread uh, addiction. We developed at the same time as we exalted the, pri the private, we developed a huge fear of the public sphere. Notice this more and more as I began to come back and forth to, 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 to Mexico. We became ferocious in our attempts to keep our kids from feeling pain. Feeling the consequences of failure, God forbid. They gave trophies for just for showing up, right? Terrif we were terrified of letting our kids go outside. God forbid kids would go outside and be, be uh, hit by a car or a child molester or some, so any kind of danger that was lurking, lurking out there. I, I remember when I was growing up, my mom had a farm, which was from Iowa, my mom had a farm bell. I was growing up in Southern California. She'd go to the, to the sidewalk, the edge of the sidewalk, 6 o'clock, ring the bell, and her boys knew to run home for dinner. That's, uh, that's because she, knew, she didn't know where her kids were, but she knew the only, one place they would never be would be inside on a sunny day. I go back on that street now, six, eight times I've been back since I've been back in Mexi from Mexico, and I've not yet once seen a human being on that street, nor the park where I used to play all the time and running and skateboarding and biking all the time, nobody is there. The same time, we begin to protect our kids and ourselves in a kind of a hyper-vigilant way, and this has effect on our children. The Atlantic Monthly ran a story a while back, a while back that said kids who grew up in an era of hyper-protection from physical pain were now demanding to be protected as well from painful ideas. They were demanding professors provide them with trigger warnings in advance of ideas that might provoke a strong emotional I th content. I thought that's why you went to college, right? To get strong um, ideas with strong emotional content, not to be protected from them. We acted as if consumption in the past and path to hap was a path to happiness. Accumulation of stuff was how you become happy. And we built into suburbs a deep and penetrating, sad isolation, and we called that prosperity. We came to believe, you know, somehow that we could now be, be uh, um, uh, all informed by cable news, 24-hour uh, cable news, when, in fact, 24-hour cable news is just like heroin. 24-hour news, uh, heroin brings addicts together. All they want to do is talk to people who do, use dope like them, who sell dope like them, who are looking for dope like them. They don't want to be around anybody who doesn't think or talk like them. Same thing was done, cable news has done the same thing to our body politic. We don't want to talk to anybody who doesn't talk like us, and of course, unless we're, unless we're uh, yelling at them. The result of all this, and more I began to believe was part of this story, the result of all this was that we became we wound up dangerously isolated and separate from each other, whether in poverty in Portsmouth or in affluence in Salt Lake or in, in Charlotte, uh, uh, North Carolina. We wound up, in other words, just like Portsmouth after Dreamland closed. Kids no longer play in the streets. Parks are underused. Dreamland lies buried beneath some strip mall. Why then do we wonder that heroin is everywhere? Our very search for painlessness, for comfort, and for convenience led us to it. Heroin seems to me is the final expression of these values we've been fostering for the last 35 years, a kind of express, final expression of our fetish for the private over the, over the, at the expense of the, of, the, of the public, a final expression of a culture that believes consumption is the path uh, to, to happiness. It turns every addict into a narcissistic, self-absorbed, self uh, uh, <coughs> pardon me, solitary, hyper-consumer. A life that finds opiates turns away from family and community and devotes itself entirely to self-gratification by buying and using and consuming one product, and that product is the drug that most makes being alone not just okay, but preferable. 
When I was a crime reporter doing the crack years, the, the hallmark institution of that, in, of, that, of, that, uh, of that problem was the crack house, very public. I went in a couple, they were very right there on the street, everyone's filing in and out, smoking their, their dope. The hallmark institution of this epidemic is the private bedroom. The private bedroom, which is our, the, that symbol of our own magnificent prosperity. Every kid has their own bedroom. That private bedroom, which is the place the mother wished their kids would stay instead of out there in the public where all the dangers were. It is that, those, those private bedrooms are where addicts are hiding their dope, shooting up, and dying. Isolation, I think, is heroin's natural habitat, and therefore I believe more strongly than ever that the antidote to heroin is not naloxone. It is community. If, if you want to keep kids off heroin, make sure people in your neighborhood do things together outside. Get out. Create your own dreamland on your block. Make your kids ride their bikes outside. Let them skin their knees. We got away from that, from what's truly, I think, great about um, about America. We rid ourselves of things so essential to us that they literally have no price, and we have therefore been invaded by cheap junk. Remember, heroin, it seems to me, is what you get when you destroy dreamland. Today, the supply of opiates on our street is so vast and potent that, it's, that getting into treatment is like, um, it takes months, and getting out is like Russian roulette, extraordinarily uh, dangerous to get out of treatment today. What happened in six months in Huntington, West Virginia, now happens on a weekend in Cincinnati or Columbus or some town in, 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 in Kentucky. The Jalisco boys that I wrote about were once the big, big fish in a small pond. Now that pond is an ocean. Many, many, many more people. Those guys are part of it, but only a part, a part of it. But that is what happens when you, as a culture, you begin to believe in silver bullet, easy answers to very complicated problems like human pain. The interesting thing, I think, is that heroin is fearsome enough, though, to make us uh, to, to kind of have the opposite on a, in a community way uh, of the effect on the community. It has the opposite of, uh, effect on the community that it has on the user. It begins to force us to begin to look to each other, to see kind of how we are bound to one another. I believe heroin, the opiate epidemic, is one of the most important forces for change in our country, changing many ideas that are old and, and kind of in the way. What it does to users, their families, and their neighborhoods is so herring, so, so nightmarish that this drug reminds those who live through it of the ties that bind them uh, to, to, to others, uh, I think. That's what I like to think, anyway. We'll see. At any rate, that's why I love the story of Portsmouth, Ohio. I thought I would go to Portsmouth only twice, tell the story of the pill mill. First time I got there, I thought, my God, is this my country? It's a harrowing place to be. It's scary. Pill mills, uh, I mean, uh, 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 rent to owns, pawn shops, hookers by the railroad tracks, on and on and on. Abandoned buildings. I found it a kind of a hapless place, fatalistic, inert. People kind of, oh, well, what can we do? <clears throat> but as I spent more time there, I realized there was another story emerging out of Portsmouth, Ohio, that I came, uh, grew to, uh, I fell in love with. It's one of American self reliance and cultural, uh, a culture of recovery was kind of, a, it, the town itself was like an addict hitting rock bottom and there was really nowhere to go for that town uh, but, but up. About that time, a couple of years before I got there, the o state of Ohio had passed a law regulating pill mills, saying that among other things, pain clinics could not be run by a felon. That was possible to do. In fact, it had been done in Portsmouth, Ohio. Now it was not possible uh, uh, to do. So they shut down all those nasty pain clinics. This is a supply story. Drug scourges start with supply, not demand. And this one is a perfect example of that. Once you cut off supply, all of a sudden addicts had space, room to breathe, to maneuver. Kind of, they were not smacked in the face immediately by, by dope as soon as every, at, every, at, every, at, every, at every turn. <clears throat> by the time I arrived, I learned later, there were NA meetings several times a day uh, mentors were available that uh, an addict could call at 3 a.m. when things were rough. When I visited, 10% of the town by then was in recovery for opiate addiction. They added a new energy to the town. I'd covered Mexican immigration for many years, and I could not avoid the parallels. Mexican immigrants bring to many towns that, where they alight um, 
dynamism, energy, willing to walk through walls, and a gratitude for a chance to remake themselves beyond what they were thought to be, to, to, to be back in their villages in, in, in Mexico. That's what recovering addicts bring in sobriety to a new, to a town. A lot of new recovering addicts in a town is like getting a huge new work, energized workforce. Dozens of kids by then, by the last time I visited, were studying at the university to be drug counselors, or studying social work. The university had in fact expanded those, those, those majors. The town had, had, had responded, it had remade governance. It had it, years ago, it had fired the city manager and let the part-time mayor just run the town, kind of, you know, haphazard. A lot of bad things happened. They hire a new city manager now, and all of a sudden, people know when the trash is going to be picked up. Simple municipal 101 kind of thing, governance 101 start. You put a light in the park and the, the hookers don't hang out there as much. <clears throat> Government began to work when it was allowed to. Portsmouth is now beginning to rebuild a uh, community. There are now four gyms, people to work out in. They are aband remodeling abandoned buildings downtown. They have a new cafe, which marks the first public place, outdoor place, where people can come and see each other and congregate since Dreamland was dug up in 1993. Portsmouth has enormous problem still. Jobs are bad, heroin is everywhere, now fentanyl of course, but now at least there's a competing story of, of recovery, of self-reliance to the story that for so long monopolized life there of let's get high and steal the manhole covers and, and, and uh, who cares. They are discovering in Portsmouth that self-reliance, ironically it seems to me, requires depending on each other, watching out for each other the way people did at Dreamland Pool. Maybe they're turning away, it seems to me, from the idea that uh, we don't have to compromise, that, uh, that uh, we can all get along on our own. To me, those ideas are, are, are heroin talking. Portsmouth is showing that, account that accountability uh, for its uh, social, economic, and municipal health, and that is what we have to do as Americans with our own bodies. We got into this because we decided we didn't want to have personal responsibility. Oh, wow. I am so sorry. You get completely absolved. <laughs> it could happen to anybody, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> ah, yeah, don't worry about it, no problem. Okay. <laughs> Oh, man. Anyway, Portsmouth is showing the accountability for the social, economic, and municipal health that I think we need to show in, for our own bodies. It was that idea of that we didn't have to be responsible for our own. We wanted quick fixes to our health problems, and we didn't need to really uh, uh, pay much attention to our own consumer choices and, and behavioral habits. Um, I think Portsmouth is showing that that is, that is wrong, and they are doing it. I think impo it's important to, 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 to work into our own lives a, a lot of ways of requiring accountability from ourselves, but also from uh, others. I think we need to question uh, the drugs that are marketed to us and prescribed to us. We need to demand that our government stop allowing pharma ads on, on TV. We need to depend personally, <laughs> including the latest one that relieves you of constipation for the Europeans. You've seen that one? I thought I was in a Kafka short story when I saw that one right there. <laughs> anyway, we need to stop uh, depending less on pills as solutions, demand grocers stock better food, and we need to fill the parks, get work out, get together in, uh, in public, and stop demanding, especially that doctors magically fix us. It will, I think, matter far less than what new product or service the pharmaceutical companies, or the underworld comes up with. I end the book this way. So the battered old town had hung on. It was somehow a beacon embracing shivering and hollowed-eyed junkies, letting them know that all was not lost, that at the bottom of the rubble was a place just like them, kicked and buried, but surviving. A place that had, like them, shredded and lost so much that was precious, but was nurturing it again. Though they were adrift, they too could begin to find their way back, back to that place called Dreamland.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm happy to take any questions. You can buy the book out there. Feel free to buy it. But meanwhile. Why weren't the, I'm sorry, why weren't the Jalisco boys guy, guys? We had people with guns here who were protecting our territory. But these guys were, were working, first of all, were working in cars. And, and, and the truth is, in the, the heroin world, it, the guys there were more, uh, so they, were, they were in a, a, a motel. They were in a house. Who was circulating out uh, miles around them was not something of, 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 gr of great interest. It was not, for example, like the, the, the gangs that, that, that populated the kind of the crack world, where you had um, guys who would move into territory, but it was all territories, physical territory. In cars, you didn't have that. So I think that was one of, of the, the main reasons. And a lot of the, the, the heroin traffickers uh, of the time, you know, they set up in a, in, a, in a cantina, they set up in a motel, they set up in a house or whatever. They were not so interested in, in, in creating uh, uh, attention to themselves because they were stationary. That kind of, I think that's mostly why. Yes, yeah, doctor. Would you be willing to comment on the era of patient satisfaction scores and how? Yes, this was, uh, it was many things I didn't mention. One was that they developed out of the patient's rights movement a, a whole, a whole uh, patient evaluation of doctors, like how well did the, but the problem was that these were blunt instrument they were not really evaluations at all. There were a few questions. Did the doctor treat your pain? Now what that's supposed to mean, it, it seemed to me if they really wanted information, it should have been a four or five page survey with lots of detailed information that you get some real idea of what, what happened during the appointment. But it's very easy for the person who wants pills and the doctor won't give it to them to say no and push the no button or fill in the no box. So easy to do that or do it on the phone. Uh, nope, he did not, and I'm very upset. Why? Well, if you figure out why, a lot of times it was because the doctor did not think that that person should have the, the kinds of pills that that person was looking for, and this was a, it was a lever, for, it became in the, op in the pain revolution a way of extorting, a lever for extorting pills from docs, basically. That's, that's what that thing, it could have been a far better tool, I think, had they had a five page uh, uh, a survey that really took you through the paces of w why didn't he and what all the reasons for that it might have been a help but what they were really looking for was to keep doctors uh, 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 um, responsive to patients the problem was in the opiate context that became very dangerous and became a way of extort and and I think what's happening now is I, I, I think I'm right about this I read this really in passing very quickly as I was on the run, but I'm, my understanding is Medicaid and Medicare have discontinued those as of October. So that it, one big part of medicine will not, will not have it. And I think, I think that's a great idea. This, these did not, they have outlived their usefulness. Either that or make it a very long, long survey that really gets into why this happened. But to me it felt like just completely, just like it was a, a little lever and you pull it because you want to get back at the doctor for not prescribing to. Yes, ma'am. We need the mic. Dollar question: You've interviewed parents from sea to shining sea at this point, and addicts in recovery or still using. What of all the stories you've collected? You have a kid who's using, or a family member, is the best treatment approach, family stance. You think at this point to oh, recommend? You know, um, if you can. Yeah, I mean, I'm a reporter. Uh, I'm not a uh, addiction uh, specialist, and I think. Uh, I, I think that, that I, we got into this because we wanted a one-size-fits-all approach, quick approach to everything, because a quick approach to pain pills, boom, for everybody, you know, cause a lot of problems. And I think we need, in almost every parts of life, to get away from that idea and to be, behave as adults. We know that, that that's just not adult way of thinking, right? So my feeling is that there's, there are many approaches that need to be available. Um, I think I was talking with some, some doctors today um, in uh, Lebanon, town right over here, um, this morning, and they were saying, well, now we're throwing Suboxone at everything. And medically assisted treatment 
is a good idea when you have all these pills out there and heroin out there, you, you get out of treatment. As I said, it's like Russian roulette. If you don't have a shield from it, but we may be at risk of getting into the same problem with Suboxone and buprenorphine that we had with, with pills where you just throw it at it and it, it's like the easy, quick answer. And it's actually very complicated ad addiction as is pain but these are very complicated to treat and it require a variety of responses, a variety of talent. And so it seems to me that we are not, we are still in that mode of, we have not learned much, if that's the case, if that's what's happening, we have not learned much about the problems you can get into um, uh, by, by looking for cheap and quick and easy. And, and you know, I understand politicians want to do something now because people are demanding stuff now. People come up to me and say, what's the solution, Sam? And that is a humbling question, because I don't know. You know, I'm a reporter. But I don't believe there is a solution. I believe there are many, many solutions. We've got to try them all. And many of them come from government. Government is the great innovative force in this, in this topic right now. The, uh, the private sector, the relevant private sector, meaning pharmaceutical companies, is completely uh, silent on this. Yes, sir, or mom, or whoever, both. I'm sorry, I can't really hear you, man. Okay, I'm, I'm curious if, if you could comment on fentanyl that's coming in and that's supposedly coming from China. The chemicals are coming from China and the, it's being, well, I, I mean, my understanding is chemicals are coming from China, the mix is happening in Mexico. And of course, that's, the, what it, that's, a, that's like a no-brainer if you're in the dope business, right? All of a sudden, you can figure out a way to make very, very cheaply, without any plant involved, you don't have to harvest anything, all of a sudden extraordinarily potent dope and you can mix it in and you can mix it with all kinds of substances and call it heroin. It isn't heroin, it's fentanyl, but, but it, it, people believe it. And, and, and that's just the latest step, you know, this is the underworld, it's unregulated. And, and so anything can happen. Now, I don't believe the guys from Jalisco are the ones doing that, honestly, because those guys really like to keep their customers alive. They're like ATMs. Why would you want to shut down the ATM, right? But um, there's, a, as I said, the Jalisco boys are, you know, it's a big ocean now. Those guys are part of it, but they're not, by quite a bit, not the only ones anymore. And there's a lot of other people acting. And so they are, that's, but that, that's what's happening. 90% of our heroin comes from Mexico. That's something that Mexico needs to address, you know. Uh, yeah. Wait, please wait for the, the microphone. The evolution of oxycontin. Yeah. The role? Uh, no, it approved FDA. The FDA approved um, oxycontin in '95 for for promotion in '96. Early '96 is when it first started. Um, it's a it's a complicated story. I'm far, I'd say far more critical of the FDA today than I would be back then. You remember there, it was this tried to kind of allude to this one in my talk. There was this drumbeat of, we're a country in pain. We don't have any tools. We need tools. There was the, the it was pretty powerful media stories, et cetera, uh, uh, and pressure being put. We need tools. We don't have them. The pharmaceutical, the, the pain specialists were saying we don't have them. And so all of a sudden, Purdue Pharma comes up with OxyContin, which is a 12-hour time release formula for oxycodone. That's what it means, oxycontin continuous is oxycontin. Uh, oxycodone continuous comes, becomes oxycontin. So um, the FDA approved this. Now there was some controversy within the agency, but they approved it for this, kind. what they mainly approved it for too, this, this is where their, their biggest mistake was, was for um, uh, general pain and for promoting, to be promoted in, in, this, in the way that it was. They could have stopped that, and they didn't. And that's what allowed it to, but now, then, then several years later, Purdue got criminally prosecuted, plead guilt, pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor, brand of, a misdemeanor charge of false branding, and eventually uh, paid $634 million of fines, and they no longer have CDs swinging in the right direction with OxyContin. They have, in fact, a very long disclaimer saying how you could get addicted and die. That's, it's a pretty long one, but it's still part of, it became part of the culture through this promotional stuff that, that the FDA uh, allowed. But you know, I kind of think back in those years and the FDA was kind of responding to public pressure, patients, everybody was demanding new tools. The FDA goes, okay, this is it. 
I, I'm far more critical, it seems to me, of, the, of what they've decided recently. They've approved another time-release drug, Zohydro, I don't know if you heard of this, uh, uh, time-release hydrocodone, over, over the op objection of all their um, um, advisors, the doctor advisor committee uh, voted 11 to 3, do not put this, don't, do not allow this out, and they still went ahead and did it. I don't have a clue why they would do that, honestly. But that's the role in this story. We'll take one yeah. more question. Is there any at the end? Or um, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, one more. One more. Well, I'm just wondering. Yeah. Wait, wait, if you could wait, wait for the wait. microphone, that'd be great. Okay. I'm wondering. I'm 65, and many, many, many years ago, I had chronic pain. I got no treatment, zero, mm -hmm. because it was in the days when there were psychedelic drugs and all that. Okay, I lived through it. Yes. And I know how to deal with pain. Right. I learned. <laughs> okay, fast forward, I had shoulder surgery. They gave me a lot of Oxycontin. It well, you were part of that revolution then, weren't it you? Was, it was, but no, let me, yeah, this is my question to you though. Yeah. And I have no problem with it. it I did not do become addicted, of course even not. though I had them. I still have some right. from six years ago. There you but go. the point, that's not the point I'm making. This, here's the point I'm making. I, and I don't have intractable pain right now, but I may have someday. And so I've noticed this. I'm wondering what you think. Is your next book going to be how train is no our pain is no longer treated? That is my question to you. No, <laughs> yeah. I'm serious because what I, about people who, and I am 65, so you know pain starts kind of looking, you're, you're kind of looking it in the right. eye a little closer now. So I'm just wondering, are doctors, and uh, you can't answer this because you're not a doctor, but you are a journalist uh -huh. and you pay attention. Yeah. So my, next, my question to you is, is that going to be your next book? That, that now pain will no longer be treated because it's like a knee-jerk reaction. I know, I've yeah, seen you're right. This because That's of not going to be my next book, but it, but I understand the question, which yeah. is, I, and I, I want to say that that's a that's part. See, it, what seems bizarre to me is that we cannot stop the pendulum in the middle, right? It goes from here to yeah. to no, nothing to everything to back to nothing. Back to nothing. Well, I don't say we're back to nothing yet. I have to I tell you, or we'll fall a long way from that. But 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 it does seem to me like. Like, like um, doctors, um, uh, I don't know, they, 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 they have trouble, and part of it is because of the system that they're in. Right? It's a for-profit health system. You gotta be, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a system based on churning patients through constantly, and you do not have time to deal with pain patients, so you either don't take them or you give them a pill and you send them on the way, but you do not have an hour for them. An hour, okay, that's not much. You don't even have that for the most, most uh, primary docs don't. And so to me, it, this is why I think we go from here to there to here to there, and, and we can't really kind of nicely settle, nestle that thing in the middle. You know, Excuse me? We have a nuanced. Oh, nuanced, uh, yeah, exactly. But I will say this, that, that I think, and I think chronic pain patients have felt this most severely, but I also have to say I think chronic pain patients were sold a bill of goods with pay, pills as well. They were sold, the idea that, that all, the only solution was this. There may be, I'm not a doctor, pain, patient, pain docs can tell you better, there may be a way of saying uh, that, that these pills have some role in pain treatment, but also other things do as well. And so we got away from that and they, they got blasted. They got just pills, 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 you know. And, and it seems to me, I, I'm very much in favor of those people continuing if that's what their doctor thinks they, they need. I don't see any point to that. They're most likely not the ones that selling the pills on the street or, or getting, getting out of control. And they, if they do need them, then they do, then they do need them. It just seems to me that they too need to understand that they got, it seems to me like they got sold a bill of goods. And I think a lot of chronic pain patients know that. I talked to one guy who was a part of an association. He says, with us, it's, with us, it's either all or nothing. We want the balance, is what he told me. And I think that's probably, that is definitely where we need to be with this. Seems great. To me. Thank you so much for Thank you. Us. I'm outside. There are books, my book, books outside. My book. If anyone wants to have a signed copy of Dreamland, stop outside. Thank you.